Hey everyone, it's Mecha here, and today we're going to make a Fire Emblem Thracia 776 Silly Mechanics tier list. This was linked to me by someone on Reddit, emotional ad, thank you. I needed a filler video because normally I stream on Wednesday, but today it's not a great day for me to be streaming uh, due to real life circumstances. I think I'll be way too tired to stream, so I'm doing this instead, and I think this will be just as fun. So... Basically, you have a bunch of uh, Microsoft Paint level pictures here of screenshots of Fire Emblem Thracia's mechanics. If you haven't played Thracia, it might be good to watch this video anyway, because it might just convince you to play it, since a lot of these mechanics have a bad reputation, but they're not actually that bad. So let's get into it. Uh, first of all, 100 Ballistas. This is something Thracia, you don't even have to have played it to know what this is, because if you played Engage, then you know what this means. 100 Ballistas that can just murk you. These are really, really annoying. Um, I'm going to rate these based on both how a blind player would experience them as how I experience them, and based on how well, you know, how fun it is to deal with these mechanics, as well as how silly it is when it happens, how much meme value there is, but also just, you know, how good of a mechanic it is game design-wise. I was going to say objectively, but obviously none of this is objective. So, ballistas, I think, are very, very funny unfortunately you can't take advantage of them as the player really can't use ballistas against the enemy so that makes them not that fun and the chapters where the ballistas exist usually makes them less fun especially chapter 10 the chapter where you face fred and owen with like a million ballistas to deal with these are not very good but they're not super super bullshit they're just very very annoying so i'm gonna put them in in c like the lower half of the tier list this one goes from s to, s to d i'll put it in c it's not terrible but it's pretty bad uh hit 99 this one is just really funny. I'm going to put it in A because it's not super amazing, but it is it is very, very funny. It's overrated in its terms of like its impact on the gameplay, I reckon, because it's going to only going to happen one in a hundred times. And it's going to happen about once, twice, maybe three times per playthrough that you miss a 99 hit attack. And yeah, it'll be kind of like silly, like, oh, well, I just missed. But I don't think it impacts gameplay a whole lot because it rarely happens. By the time it happens most frequently, is when you're outstanding the enemies by like a million points, and so missing attack is thus consequential. Like, you'll usually kill them on the second attack, or with a crit, or you have some other units that can take care of the problem. This is mostly bad. Like, missing is mostly bad in the early game, when your units are closest to the enemy stat-wise. That's when it has the most impact. Also, staves, they can miss, but not with the 99 hit. Once you have 100 hit with staves, you'll never miss. I think a lot of people don't know that, and that also... Uh, I think greatly alleviates this problem because staff hits are very crucial every time. Uh, but attacks, usually not that bad. I've been screwed over by 99 misses once or twice, but every time I have been, there's been ways I could play around it. So for me, I'm just left with like super high meme value. I think the hit 99 is very funny. The one hit is probably the bigger impact. I don't see it anywhere on the pictures down here, so I'm just going to mention that here. Attacks are also uh, floored at one hit, so an enemy will never have a 0% chance to, to kill you or to hit you. Uh, this can definitely be worse, but again, by the time you're facing one hit, you probably also have other stats that can buffer if you do get hit, so it, it has like the same drawbacks, if you will, to 99 hit. I don't think it really matters. Uh, Authority Stars, this is a great system of Thracia. I really love Authority Stars, because unlike in other games, every unit can theoretically have Authority Stars. They can be spread across multiple enemies and multiple allies. It changes who you deploy, because some characters might not do anything physically or magically, but they might still have Authority Stars, and they're worth deploying for that reason. It's not super interesting to deploy someone like Glade or Finn or... Conum work, they're not going to do anything besides just sit there and have like a passive charm bonus across the map for like 3% hit or avoid. But it's interesting that you can have a unit deployed that literally does nothing but stand there and, you know, help out. Instead of someone who probably wasn't going to help out much anyway. Like by the time you're considering this kind of option, you usually already have deployed uh, most of the main combat and staff stars anyway. So authority is just fun and it adds some strategy to like killing bosses early uh there's for example the defense chapter chapter 14 uh where tara is being invaded you have a boss that rushes you down and he has authority stars and he's risky to fight but if you can kill him i think you remove like four or five authority stars from the map so that's like minus nine or twelve hit and avoid on all enemies it's pretty worth it to do but you have to figure out a plan to face the boss it might be worth spending like an expensive resource like a sleep staff on him just to make it safe and i think that makes the gameplay more interesting uh, so I do like Authority Stars a lot. Uh, this is the symbol for a cost. Uh, used to be called Charge. It's a skill that Dagdar has. And Selfina has it as well. I forgot there's any enemies. I think that's about it for playable characters. Uh, Conomore has it as well. Uh, so a cost works differently than it does in Genealogy. In that in Genealogy, it's a chance to get an extra battle in. 
uh, but it can like proc multiple times per battle. And in Thracia, a cost can always activate, and it always activates exactly once if it activates. And it checks at the start of the battle, do you have more HP, and do you have more attack speed than the enemy? And if it does, then it will be an extra battle. And this is really good for someone like Dagdar because he gets to get half multiple rounds of combats. His doubling can be a little shaky, so sometimes the cost can make that up and just smack people in the face with it. But the funniest bit is enemy phase, <laughs> when a cost can be used against you. Even if you don't counter the enemy, a cost can still activate. So if Dagdar is being attacked by a Ballista or by long range magic, they'll quote unquote double him because he's activating extra round of combat. Even though he's not countering, uh, the game still sees okay, Dagdar has more HP and more speed. So you know, two combat, two rounds of combat it is. I don't care that you don't counter. And that to me, first of all, is just hilarious. And it also, as long as you're not getting killed by it, it's pretty useful for the player sometimes. You can run up ballistas faster or long range magic if you want to. If you don't want to just directly run up to the enemy or you can't, you can instead, you know, drain their users from long range. I find that pretty helpful to have around. You also have an Acost manual you can use on any character you want, by the way. Uh, I usually leave that unused or like sell it because it's such a risky skill to have. Uh, there's not a playable character that has it, Selfina. And she can definitely die very easily because she has like, she's borderline O-code by a lot of enemies that, you know, like ballistas. <laughs> so you don't want to have her in range and then get doubled and just die. So very risky skill, but very, very funny. And also just very useful. I'm going to put it in an S tier. Uh, this is Adept. I don't know why Adept was in here because it's pretty boring in Thracia. It's just you attack again if you have a speed, I think attack speed percentage uh, proc. So if you have 20 speed, that's 20% chance to attack again. I know why it's here, maybe because it's a little different from genealogy, but it's kind of boring. Uh, I'll put it like, it's not bad because it's, no, it's not hurting you, it's not annoying to deal with. I have like another care, a couple of skills in mind that have to go somewhere else, so just throw this here, I guess. Ambush, uh, this is probably ambush spawns. Ambush spawns are always bad, always. There's there's no exceptions. I've been convinced in Fire Emblem that there's no such good thing as ambush spawns. I've always said that if you're relying on ambush spawns as a game designer to you know, get the player, do a gotcha, make them waste, you know, rewinds or make them restart a chapter. You feel somewhere along the way. It doesn't really matter what you did. Uh, you can instead put enemies in a spot where they'll be annoying to deal with, but not impossible. You see them coming. So I, I always use this example, but Conquest puts reinforcements in spaces that are somewhat hard to reach and often have terrain benefits. But they'll still put them there at the start of player phase. So if you want to, you can attack them. And if you have units good enough, they can kill them. Or you can run away from them. Uh, or you can just deal with the fact that they are there. You know what's happening next turn, next enemy phase. So you don't need to use ambush spawns if your map design is good enough. Most games, unfortunately, don't have good enough map design. Thankfully, Awakening did... Uh, not Awakening. Awakening, like, reintroduced ambush spawns. Uh, Shadow Dragon had them as well. Uh, New Mystery had them. Very unfortunate. Uh, Echoes, I don't believe, does. But Engage, fortunately, does not. Thankfully. It's such a bad mechanic. That said, in Thracia, I mean, I play Thracia so much, I know where all the ambush spawns are, so I can either block them or run away from them. But if you're a blind player, this is just horrendous to reach. I don't think it really adds anything, so this is a bad mechanic. Uh, you'll notice this is a mechanic that is bad, but it's not Thracia exclusive. Thracia is the best game. Next up, we have... Uh, I think this is capturing. It's got to be capturing because it's a playable unit holding an enemy unit as opposed to this one over here. So I'm assuming this is just about capturing in general. Uh, so I love capturing. I'm a big fan of being able to just kidnap an enemy and take their weapons and then throw them away. I think, I think it adds a strategic depth to the game, and it also allows you to just, just do funny things, get interesting weapons. Uh, I like how the enemies are sort of prepared for capturing sometimes. Like, they'll put tomes on a long-range tome user so they're harder to capture, or um, they will have, like, massive build stats, or they'll even require you to capture an enemy in order to recruit them. That happened several times. There's a lot of things they did with capture in that game that isn't just, oh, you can capture enemies, cool. It does come with a significant drawback that I do want to address. That's why I'm probably not going to put it in S tier, but pretty high up. I think capture makes the game tedious for people who just can't stop themselves from getting everything that they could. Uh, they see that the enemy has a short lance, a javelin, a vulnerary, an iron axe, and they're like, oh, it's a resource. I'm going to try and get it. And so they'll try to capture like everything. And worse, is when they try to use characters that aren't very good at capturing to capture enemies. So it's pretty easy to capture an enemy with your brave weapon, you know, Finn's Brave Lance, Dagdar's Brave Axe, uh, the Brave Sword you get in Master. Those are fairly easy to capture with because you hit twice regardless of the capture's, you know, penalties. You have your stats while you're trying to capture it, as if you're trying to rescue them. 
So it's not that bad we're using a Brave Weapon, but when you're trying to capture with a normal dude, uh, some everyday guy like Brighton trying to capture a soldier using his Iron Sword, oh, that gets so tedious. It's so annoying because you have your attack and you have your skill and you're already like forward KOing these enemies in the first place sometimes. So trying to capture like every enemy you find, it can be really annoying. And I can see why people would do this. I always recommend don't bother. Just if you see an easy capture or like a very valuable enemy, then you go for them, and if not, just kill them. It's fine. You'll get more chances to capture like valuable stuff later. And you don't have that money uses for money anyway. You get enough free weapons and enough easy captures that you can sell to buy the things that help you the most. Like there's very diminishing returns on captures above a certain threshold. So I'm usually fairly conscious of like what I want to capture and what I don't. Um, even though I know I can buy like S strength later in the game or stat boosters later in the game. I know that if I capture a reasonable amount, I'll be fine. But a blind player, they'll be very tempted to capture almost everything. And I think that kind of sucks for them. So for that, I I still think that all the pros hold up very well, though. So I'm going to put it in an A uh, with that little caveat of like how it tricks people into making the gameplay worse for themselves. People basically trying to optimize the fun out of the game because they see things they can normally never get in other Fire Emblem games. And they're like, oh, I'm going to capture this one generic enemy, the next one, next one, next one. And it just, it just slows down the game to a crawl. It's really annoying. Uh, con, and then a very small note saying level. So I'm assuming this is about con or build levels. There's no drawback to this. This is just super, super funny. Just, the idea that your unit gets fatter as they level up is very cool to me. Uh, and Gage, pretty sure brought this back. He's level up build in that game. I don't know why, but I'm very glad they did because it just, it is, there's no real drawbacks to it. Like your units... I guess sometimes they can get so heavy that you, other units have a harder time or can't even possibly carry them. But, you know, the funny things you can do with con leveling up far outweigh that. Like the fact that your thieves can level up build. I keep calling it build, but build and con are the same in this game, alright? Just different translations of the same stat. Uh, the fact that your thieves can level up con and then steal more items is hilarious. And the fact that someone can become too fat to carry is hilarious. And yeah, I just love it. it it's also just like part of the uh, the capture mechanic basically so in that sense i gotta put con level ups in s tier glad they brought it back and engage next up is the dance i don't know why dance is here because dance isn't really a thracia mechanic so i'm not sure why we have it up in here um i mean dancer's good i guess uh, i guess maybe it's referring to the fact that enemies can dance each other which it's it's kind of mid because who cares um like oh actually if it's something's made i'm no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, it just wastes your time, but it's also very funny that enemies dance each other, and then if they do attack you because of it, that's very, very funny. So honestly, I can't put it anywhere but an S. Uh, maybe A, A, because it's not as exciting, but it is pretty funny, but it does sometimes waste your time. Uh, but then 12X, for example, if you don't, you know, trivialize the map in turn one, which if you have played the game, you know what I mean. But if you have played the game and you have never trivialized it, you don't know what I mean, I don't want to spoil you. Or if you haven't played it, I don't want to spoil you. Um, but there are dancers on the map and there's archers on the map and if they attack you and then get danced and they attack you again I think this is great because what other games have enemy dancers that actually work as intended? I can barely think of enemy dancers to begin with but I know that if you put a dancer in like a GBA game for example They don't work. They just stand there and die <laughs> generally speaking They'll attack you if you give them weapons they can use but they won't dance So I think the fact that they got that to work in Thracia like Kaga did it first is just excellent uh, this must be capture baiting, where you put a uh, unit without any weapons and low constitution range of an enemy. And enemy's like, oh, I can get a free capture here and just grab them. I think that's great. Uh, it's broken because the unit will not be dead. They'll just be captured and you can get them back by killing the enemy. And because the enemy had to capture and rescue your units, they have all their stats besides HP and luck. So they're now very, very easy to kill. This is super abusable, but it's so fun. I don't even mind it. This is an excellent mechanic that... I'm not going to say it's, it should be in every game, but it's damn funny, and you should have used it every chance that you get. Is it better than capture? You know, yeah, because it's not that drawback of, oh, I want to capture every enemy. It's just, okay, capture bait is good. It's broken, and that's why it's great. <laughs> Here we got two arrows with some uh, slightly hard-to-reach white text, leaf abandoning teammates. Uh, I'm assuming this also refers to just the escape mechanic in general, because I don't really see anything else that refers to that. Um, but 
yeah, uh, Leaf escapes first. All his enemies are abandoned. All his friends are abandoned. Leaf escapes last. Um, you save everyone. It's a great mission objective because it makes you have use your whole group of units to get to the end rather than having to just get Leaf to the seize point. Um, and an escape map is inheritably unskippable unless you're willing to leave behind units, which is a big trade-off because you only have so many units to work with. You can sometimes deploy a bunch of flunkies you're not using and then get leave to the save, to the escape point and then just abandon them and get them back later through a, a side quest. But that's still a strategic consideration and most people aren't willing to leave behind people, period. You should be because that guy in chapter you get to play is pretty good. But usually that's still like a trade-off people don't want to make. So they just have to play this chapter straight. Um, and I think anything that makes the player engage with the map is usually a good thing. Uh, the big escape mechanic, it used to be kind of controversial because the translation patch, the old one, the Shia patch, didn't really make it clear that Leaf had to be the one who escaped last. He's like arguing with Fergus about who should escape first or last. And Fergus is being a bit unclear exactly what happens. And uh, Leaf is like... I think he's, the literal translated line, or the, the line that was put in there back then, was something among the lines of, um, if I escape, uh, so does everyone else, which kind of makes you think, oh, it's like arrive, leave just gets to the arrow and everyone is fine, right? And they get to the next chapter, and worst case scenario, you overwrite your safe and then you have no one to beat the next chapter with excite leaf, and you just get soft locked. So always stagger your saves, but also translate the game clearly because the new translation makes it perfectly clear what happens exactly um so it's a good mechanic i like it it was a bit tricky at first but we're not going to go by old translation patch rules this is an s tier mechanic you guys can tell i like thracia right uh fatigue this might surprise you i used to really like fatigue because it forces you to rotate your army a little bit and consider okay if i'm deploying this character here are they really going to do enough or is it better for them to take off a chapter so that they can reset their fatigue because like a real quick refresher your fatigue is a stat that starts at zero and builds up as you do things um you battle you heal you dance everything that gives xp gives you a point of fatigue or more and if the, if at any point during the prep screen <laughs> if during the prep screen your unit uh has more fatigue than they have max hp then they cannot be deployed on the map unless you have a specific item to cure it the s strength but generally you don't it's an expensive item you don't want to exceed your fatigue but if you sit out the chapter your fatigue reset resets no matter if you were fatigued before or not so it's possible that you have a unit that's just doing all the work in a chapter and all of a sudden they're fatigued and they have to sit it out so this is kind of an anti-snowballing mechanic that conceptually i like because if you have a really good unit let's say you have aspel who's really good or fergus who's really good uh, or orson and if they do just all the work for every chapter at some point they're going to get fatigued they have to sit out the chapter and that's unfortunate because now you have to use units you might not have trained so it, it kind of forces you to think a little bit about who you deploy in which chapters and Thracia gives you enough different strong units that you can make it work but I think there's a feel bad part to it that makes me not like it as much anymore and that's that you're getting penalized for using your units so doing combat period is hurting you a little bit and that feels bad so I don't like it as much anymore as I used to uh, I think it it works for me because I know which units can be expendable for next chapters and which not. But if you've never played the game before and you are not looking ahead on maps, which I recommend, I don't recommend you look uh, maps up in advance when you're playing for the first time. You can only play a game blind for one time. So I would not recommend Fatigue. And I think actually there was a ROM hack I played, Sun God's Wrath, where they had Fatigue. And I actually recommended they make it optional for new players to just not play with Fatigue. Because I... Th I found that the fact that fatigue was in the game was making me fatigued about using units. I didn't really like uh, having it there. Even though the game was very generous with items to compensate for fatigue and giving you extra pre-promotes to deal with the fact that your main units might be fatigued, I just didn't like playing with it. It has a bad feel with it. Um, so I used to say, okay, it's like an, uh, an A or an S tier mechanic, but now I'm like, uh, it's like below average, honestly. It's not a great mechanic. So I'm gonna put it in here in, in C. Uh, these are not exactly in any necessary order, by the way, if, in case it wasn't clear. I'm just putting them from left to right. Uh, next up is a black square. <laughs> this has got to be Fog of War. Uh, I'm not a super big fan of Fog of War in general. Again, I have played Thracia, so I know where everything is, and so the fog doesn't really hurt me very much. I rarely bunk into enemies or go to the wrong direction. It can be a little hard for me to tell sometimes where the enemies are, but usually I'm fine with being in the dark. I can blindly warp a units to where the enemies are 
That said, uh, for blind players, it's a pretty big pain in the butt. Kind of sucks, and uh, there's not there's enough torches to see things, but the torches themselves can be a little hidden. Uh, for example, in chapter two X, which it's already a guiding chapter, there is a torch hidden on a fort, and there's no great way to tell where they are. I think the translation patch tries to put a hint to it, which wasn't in the original game. That I think that tells you enough about the state of the game. And the torch doesn't really light up all that much. You don't have extra vision on thieves, and it's just pitch dark. You can't see the terrain. You can, you cannot see enemies, but you can see your own movement range. And that usually kind of tells you uh, how a path through the like terrain goes, but it's still kind of a pain having to constantly check it. So I'm not a super big fan of the fog. It is unquestionably part of Thracia's uh, bad reputation that this fog exists, uh, but I don't think it's very good. Uh, I would actually say it's uh, it's not as bad as fatigue, but I think it is pretty annoying. Uh, you do get a torch staff, but again, it's doesn't it's not as flexible as other torch staffs are either. So yeah, not a big fan of the big the big black square. That said, if you pay a little bit of attention to the story, you can usually tell at least where the seize point is because I feel like in every fog map there's like a little bit of dialogue with the boss <laughs> that tells you where he is, roughly speaking. So if you pay attention to that, that helps a little bit. Forced dismount indoors. I'm not sure what this uh, little symbol is, but we know it's forced by this month indoors because it says it down below. Um, I'm okay with this. It balances the game a little bit. I think if you were not forced to this month indoors, some of your mod units would be really broken as opposed to just good. And instead, this game gives foot units a chance to shine, which is pretty rare in the juke draw games, isn't it? So I do like forced this month indoors. It does carry a bit of bad unit feel for people that main other weapons uh, and it's kind of, it feels a bit unfair that someone like Fergus, who uses swords both indoors and outdoors, uh, like on his mount and off his mount, is just, can just keep his weapon, whereas someone like, I don't know, Brighton or Hicks or Glade or Finn, they are forced to use swords indoors. But it also provides, you know, a way for units to distinguish themselves, because some units have good weapons when they're indoors and some units do not. And that includes mounted units. So even someone like Finn has a sword rank, where other on this mounted units do not. Of course, this game being Thracia, this is not exactly evenly divided, and the units that's already not units that are already not very good are often the ones that also have to deal with like E-rank swords indoors. So it's not exactly a balancing factor always, uh, but it does make you know someone like Fergus or like flyers like Dean a lot less busted than they would be if you could just fly them indoors everywhere. So I do like this mechanic; it carries some bad feels to it, but overall I think it's a it's a win for the game. I think that. I want to put it in an S, but the way I'm phrasing it, I can't really put it anywhere but an A. I'm going to throw it if, like somewhere here. This is definitely an unbiased tier list that is, uh, you know, making an order up as it goes along. <laughs> forever ailments. So status effects last forever, unless you cure them with restore. So if someone puts you to sleep, well, now you're sleeping for the rest of the map. If someone poisons you, you're taking damage for the rest of the map unless someone restores you. And by the way... Um, there's a lot of poison weapons in this game. All the dark magic that's on enemies is poisoning you. Uh, swords, poison, uh, there's like poison swords and poison lances, stuff like that as well. Um, enemies can use sleep stabs on you. You do get the tools to deal with this most of the time, but there's one thing that makes me want to like put this um, down a bit. And that's the fact that in chapter 12, you are faced with an enemy boss that puts you to sleep. You have no restore staff, you have no way to know where he is because it's fog of war. Uh, you have no units that are immune to that sleep. Um, you just have your units go to sleep. If you played the game a lot, you might notice that they aim for people with high HP uh, with a sleep staff. Like, I believe it just prioritizes straight up people with the most HP going backwards, and it treats Leaf, at least, as having one HP, so he goes last. So if you deploy a bunch of units, you can make sure Leaf never gets targeted. But it's not... I can't really defend this. Uh, the Forever Poison also just makes everything take forever, because everyone just takes damage at the start of their turn. And uh, I think there's even a poison entry for later, uh, like lethal poison. Yeah, there we go. It's over here. <laughs> that one does not help. It's uh, it's a bad feel mechanic. That said, I do like that the player gets access to these as well. And so you can just disable problematic enemies. The fact that they're forever ailments doesn't really help very much there because if you put an enemy to sleep for uh, you know for three turns or for five turns, that's almost the same in final terms as like forever because you're generally going to kill the enemy before they wake up. So it's not super bad. Sleep also resets all your stats to zero, besides HP and luck. So if you are put to sleep and you're in range of an enemy, you're probably dead or at least captured, because you also unequip all your weapons. Uh, so Forever Ailments is annoying. Very annoying for the player. 
I'm fine with it, but I know not everyone is. I'm gonna put it up and down at the, the C tier. Nah. It's more of a D tier, honestly. It's, it's still better than ambush spawns, but I think it was a bit too much for this game. You would wonder why I'd still enjoy it, but that's because everything else is still higher tiers. Uh, trade. Forever trading. S tier mechanic easily. Very glad they put it in engage. Like, this is just so good. I'll put it in here when I'm done talking. Uh, for the timestamp people. Or people who are playing without timestamps, because I'm not sure if I have timestamps up in time. Uh, yeah, trading is good. And being able to do it multiple times, especially in a game where capturing exists, is almost a necessity. I can't imagine liking this game if you have no option to trade forever. Uh, the Tearing Saga also has trading forever. Uh, FE3, the game that came before this, before FE4, also has this. So people call it Thracia trade, but it really is FE3 trade. Uh, but I'm glad it's there. I'm not sure if it's in Gaiden. I don't think it is. Uh, it is in Echoes, though, I think. Not entirely sure. Anyway, the point is, it's really nice to be able to just... The, the, the idea of forever trading is if you put a unit between other units, you can do as many trade actions as you want until you do your attack or your weight or your staff or your dance or something like that. So it's like a non-committal action. You know how in GBA you can trade and then attack? Well, in this game, you can trade and then trade and then trade and then trade and then trade as often as you want. Just don't end your turn and you can keep trading. Very helpful to get items from one place to another. So I do like that. You also, I don't see this here. Uh, you can also do this with uh, taking and um, giving units. So if you're like rescuing someone or capturing someone, or you're like holding someone that you've captured, you can also take and give however many times you want. Um, this is also obviously S tier. Great mechanic. Very flexible. All right. Heal and heal. We have uh, healing double and healing miss. Healing double is just funny. It's not spectacular, but it is pretty funny. Um, you can, I think, I don't remember the odds exactly, but it don't really matter because you can't strategize around it. But there is a chance that if you use a healing staff or any anything staff, even physic, there's a chance you just cast it twice. And I think you get double XP. I think you get double weapon XP. And I think it, it does heal them twice, obviously. And that's just funny. It's not great. We need to put something in B tier, so I'm probably going to put this there. There, there isn't really much to say about it because it just kind of happens. The funniest thing is when your physic has five uses. It just has maximum of five uses. And then you double heal when you don't need to. You're healing to someone to like one HP below their max and then you heal them again through the double mechanic. And then you just use two physic uses for no reason. It's stupid, but physic is plentiful enough that it's not going to hurt you too much. This is very stupid when it happens. It goes into B tier. It's like, whatever. <laughs> it's just funny. But it doesn't really add a whole lot to the game. Uh, heal miss. This is a big one for Thracia. This is what I think, if you ask people on the streets, if you just ask someone, hey, uh, how do you feel about the current government? How do you feel about inflation rates? And how do you feel about Thracia 796? They probably know a lot about the first two. And then about the Thracia, all they know is staff can miss. That's, I feel like all they know is like, they know fog of war. Uh, they know staffs can miss. That's about it. That's all they know about Thracia. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not a fantastic mechanic, I will say, but I think it's more hilarious than actually harmful. People are worried, I think, that you have like an injured unit and you run up to them with your healer and you heal them up and then they are going to be missing and then your unit is in range of a bunch of enemies and they can die. That can happen, uh, but there's like one or two chapters where that is likely to happen and everywhere else, not super likely. Uh, first of all, the odds of it happening are just not that high, period. Uh, the odds for staff accuracy is 60 plus skill times 4. I know this by heart because it's a very easy formula and because I know that 10 skill always lets you hit. There's no 99 miss with staffs, like I said earlier. So imagine your unit is uh, is injured and you have a 10 skill staff user, you'll heal them just fine. There are portions of the game where you only have access to staff users with low skill, uh, specifically Nana during the Manster arc. She has like, what, three base skill. So there's a pretty good chance she just misses. And that's unfortunate. It happens sometimes. But what this game doesn't tell you, or what this tier doesn't tell you, I think, is that this game also has vulnerabilities which don't heal 3 or 10 HP. They heal all your HP. They're elixirs, and you get a bunch of them. Like They're not distributed like elixirs. They're distributed like vulnerabilities. They're like on your units. They're on enemy units. You can just steal them or capture them. Uh, they're found in like item chests or villages or stuff like that. You get a fair amount of vulnerabilities for what you need. So usually you're healing a unit is not your only option. You generally have something better uh, to do. Are there spots where your units really need to turn to attack and then also need to get healed? Probably. They exist, but they're very rare. 
So I wouldn't worry too much about heal misses if you're playing this game. Just play in mind with the fact that it can happen. Uh, it can even benefit you because if you're using an like a, a personal staff that gives a lot of XP and weapon XP, there's a chance you'll miss. But the staff use won't get consumed if you miss. You keep your, you know, three use Hamurn or whatever it is. So you get all the benefits from using it, except you know the actual effects. But you keep the use of it, which is actually abused in like a lot of speed runs and LTCs and stuff like that. Um, so Hamurn is. Uh, Hammer missing is, for example, something people rig <laughs> sometimes. So heal misses can be beneficial for the player too. So I just think it's funny. I understand the aversion to it though. So I wouldn't, I don't blame anyone for hating this. But personally, I don't think it's a very big deal. Um, and I also just think it's hilarious when you miss a heal. Like I think it has a high funny factor. Uh, for that, I'll throw it in B as well. Now uh, it's it's very different from double, but it's like very high highs and low lows. Whereas double is just very mid all around. So I think this fits in B tier. Next up, we have Lethal Poison. Uh, I already said I'm not a big fan of this. It does allow you to staff abuse if you want to. Like if you have a unit that you just want to level up staff rank or level up through well, leveling them up, then having a unit poisoned is a great way to just abuse that. But other than that, poison is just a waste of time in Fire Emblem and it probably shouldn't exist. And the fact that it can kill you is just worse. Uh, you can usually leave a unit alone for a long time, but imagine a unit being at 1 HP. And then you try to heal them and you miss. That feels bad. You can rescue your unit to stop them from taking poison damage if it doesn't impede you all that much. That's an option you have. Um, something else I've done before by accident is uh, I had this exact unit, Laura, in range of an enemy that poisoned her and she was at 1 HP. So if it came back to my turn, then she would die to poison damage because it, it's applied at the start of player phase. But fortunately, another enemy ran up to her and captured her. <laughs> so she got captured by the enemy. And while you're being captured or rescued, you don't take poison damage. So afterwards, I was able to take um, take the enemy out. Laura was dropped, and then I could heal her or rescue her again or something like that. It's uh, just a little fun thing. So there are some funnies with it, but general lethal poison is uh, not great. Uh, that's that lethal poison is also in FE7, FE6, like a bunch of other games. I think they only took it out for like fates, if you even count that. I don't remember if engage has poison, uh, but usually poison can't kill you. I think echoes poison can also not kill you. This does like a frick load of damage. Uh, that said, not a big fan of uh, Lethal Poison. I'll just throw it in uh, bottom of C, top of D or something. <laughs> I don't know why res is being crossed out. Like, units don't have res? I mean, this is patently false. Some units do have a resistance stat. It's just magic units and stuff. So, I don't even know what this is. Oh, there's no res stat because it's merged with magic. That's probably it. That's the Okay, I was a little confused there because I completely forgot about this. Um, yeah, there's no rest that in the game is merged with uh, magic. I generally like this mechanic. I think it's fine. Uh, it's honestly really player sided when you think about it because the player has the tools to abuse it with something like pure water or uh, the ensorcel staff, which is basically barrier, but now it also boosts your magic. Um, if you're in a fight with a bunch of mages, you can just use a magical weapon and just get rid of them with this uh, with one of those boostings things. Um, if you have a unit with bat resistance, then yeah, they're going to be bad at using magic weapons, but that's no different from what it is in other games. Like, try using a Leaven Sword and engage with someone that bat has bad magic. They'll probably have bat resistance too. Like, it doesn't really change all that much, except it's in the player's favor. But it is really fun. I do like how someone like Amelda, for example, or even Nana, sometimes you can give them a sword, uh, get their sword rank high enough to use uh, the Fire Sword, which grants plus five magic, and now you have a staff user with. An extra 5 magic that can surpass the 20 all on caps in Thracia, which we'll get into in a second. Um, and that's pretty cool. So it gives the player more options usually, I'm a, I'm a fan of that. It's not it's not S tier because it's not that well thought out or anything, but I, I think it's interesting. So I'm going to put it like uh, somewhere around here, I think. It's fun. Next up are movement level ups. Even the biggest Thracia haters that I've met in my life, you know who you are. They don't mind movement level ups. They think they're harmless at worst and just funny at best. I think the unwritten law about Thracia that I'm hoping to codify into real law one day is if you get a movement level up on a unit, you have to use that unit for the rest of the game. They're going to be your carry. You have no choice in the matter. Movement level ups are fun and you should always love them. <laughs> you know, how do you say this? Satisfy them? Agree with them? There's some kind of English word for this. You should abide by them. They, they're the law. You should always use unit that gets movement level ups. If you level up and you proc that 1, 2, 3%, you have no choice in the matter. Having the unit zoom across the map, give him the leg ring if you can. Stuff like that. You have to abide by it. It's so funny. I can't even say a whole lot more. There's nothing more satisfying than having a foot unit just run across the whole map. I'm convinced of it. <sighs> 
Plus, you get to make use of juicy movement stars if you're lucky enough to get a level up on them too. And movement stars, they're more silly. I think they're worse than movement level ups because you can't really play around a movement star very well. Sometimes you have an opportunity to, but generally it's just, okay, I move a unit, I'm gonna assume their turn ends here, and there's like a 5% chance or a 10% chance that they just get a movement star and they move again. And it's like, okay, what do I do now? And sometimes that can help a little bit. Sometimes you're not counting on getting an extra turn, but you would still like one and it works out. Often it doesn't and it's just like funny. But it is really funny. It is really nice when a unit just dances for themselves randomly. I do like it. It's like a upper B, lower A kind of thing for me. You do get a lot of movement stars. Uh, on your units total, so it's probably going to happen at least once per chapter or so. Also, enemies have movement stars. This can be a bit tricky in the Xavier chapter especially, where all the armor knights you're supposed to keep alive and have NPCs talk to him kind of deal. Uh, it's really funny. We'll get, we'll get into it with, with Xavier, but the point is it can really get obnoxious when you just... You're counting out all your moves just right, you're surviving with like 1 HP and the enemy's like, Okay, movement star, I'm gonna attack again, you're dead now. <laughs> that can happen too. So I'm gonna say it's like yeah, it's like upper B, isn't it? It's like it's like funny, but not as nearly as funny as movement stars, and usually just kind of gets it away or does nothing for you. Um, but there are funny runs where you rig movement stars all the time. There's a Thracia patch called uh, Overclocked, I think, by Miasis, and that one guarantees movement stars. That one is something else. <laughs> that makes it funny again. That puts them in S tier, but since they're not guaranteed normally, I'm gonna have to go with uh, upper B. FCM uh, used to be called Pursuit Critical or Follow Up something, Follow Up Critical, I think. So people would call it fuck and they'd think they were very funny. FCM is the nice middle ground where it's like correct, but at least it's not stupid. Um, basically, your second hit has a higher chance to crit depending on, you know, your follow up critical modifier, some number between zero and five. If it's zero, your second hit actually cannot crit. If it's one, it's the same as on other games. You just, same chance as your first hit. And if it's higher, like 2, 3, 4, or 5, you have a massive chance to crit. This is a good mechanic. It keeps your player characters um, way stronger than the enemy normally. Uh, you can stack criticals very easily to get to like 99 crit. I think actually it maxes out at 100 on like hits. So someone like Fergus or Orson or what have you. Sarah even I think has, fought, has like 5 full up critical modifiers. It's been a while since I've played with Sarah combat. Um, the point is you can get guaranteed crits very easily with this... Uh, mechanic. It's just fun. It's what makes your player units more broken than they already are. Um, like, more broken than with scrolls, even. So, I, I do, like, follow-up critical modifier a fair bit, because it gives you a fighting chance sometimes when you need one, like, in in Manster. It's just good. Uh, we'll throw it in uh, in A, I guess. Better than dancing, for sure. Not better than capturing, I don't think. It's it's better than... Yeah. We'll throw it around here somewhere. Uh, scrolls. Scrolls are scrolls, you know, boosts to your growth rates, and they're also doubling up as iron runes. You cannot get crit while holding a scroll unless you're getting fighting a wrath enemy. But the main draw for most people is the growth boosts. Another thing that just makes player units absolutely broken in Theracia if you just use them for long enough. Uh, the earliest scrolls are like kind of whatever, but at some point you get a 3% speed growth scroll and any unit that normally is supposed to be slow as slugs is like Dalson and Marty and people like that. They should be slow, but with the set scroll they're not, and so they just get really fast instead. It just takes a long time, because most scrolls give like a 10 to 15% chance boost. Growth in Thracia aren't that high, so it takes a while before growth unit really pays off. But in theory, anyone can become good thanks to scrolls. It's very satisfying to do. So, yeah, put scrolls on people, and they'll become good automatically. It just takes a little while. Uh, the most broken scrolls do come a little bit later, fortunately. The, the set scrolls, like the example, um, that proves that the rule is there. Uh, but mostly for like stat like strength, it takes a while before you get a good scroll for it. But small bonuses add up, and the the insurance against crits especially is nice because in Thracia, I believe every point of luck gives half a point of crit avoid. You do have some supports that give crit avoid. I think ten each, but not everyone has supports. Not everyone has good supports. Um, not everyone can always be in range of support partner all the time. And even with the crit avoids, sometimes you just don't have enough to negate enemy crits. Sometimes enemies have like cutting edges or. Battle axes, stuff like that. So the scrolls are really nice for that too. I really enjoy uh, having this here. I think scrolls are like the main proof against the fact that this game is supposed to be elitist or super anti-player or super hard. It has those elements at times, but it also shows that Kaga is willing to be like, okay, 
you can have a nice thing and just enjoy it. Um, that's it. You do have to balance scrolls with your rest of your inventory. You can't just carry around six scrolls. Well, you can, but you only have room for one weapon. So that weapon better be the best weapon you can possibly have for the entire situation of the battle. Uh, that can be enough if your weapon is really good, but sometimes it's not. So scroll stacking does have its minor downsides. Uh, I'll throw the scrolls in S. I think they're a very good mechanic. Uh, I don't know what this is. I, I, I know it's Blizzard, you know, about to hit some guy with a sword. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it's Blizzard putting an enemy to sleep, which personally I don't fall asleep when I have a snowstorm on my head. Um, we'll just assume it's either that or like it's supposed to be about long range magic. But if it's about Blizzard putting people to sleep, eh, it's a good mechanic. It's like a replacement sleep staff. Um, all status staffs have, well, infinite range in this game. Blizzard only has 10, so there's a limiter on it, but you only get Blizzard to pretty late in the game, regardless. And when you do get it, you also have access to a bazillion sleep staff, so... Does it really matter? I guess it's annoying when an enemy has it, but even that is pretty rare. Um, I've seen it, I know the chapter it occurs in, it's like 21x, I want to say. And... I think like one or two more occasions. It usually doesn't matter very much, it's fine, I guess. We'll throw it in the, uh, in the Adept tier, it doesn't really matter very much. Uh, infinite range staves, these I think are very fun. Um, for blind players, it can be a bit annoying to deal with enemy sleep staves, like the chapter 12 example I gave earlier. That is the one where I think it's unfair, but right after that you'll have access to that specific sleep staff, and you can use it against enemies, so that kind of makes up for it, doesn't it? And then you get more late in the game, and you know, player phase turn one always comes before enemy phase, so whenever you're faced with an enemy status staff, you have the option to beat them to the punch and sleep them, or, you know, if you have restore staves, even if you get caught off guard, you can cure it and then, you know, throw it right back at them. So, this is this is often treated as something that Thracia uh, hurts the player with, but I think it's honestly very player favorite if you're willing to use your resources to combat strong enemies. I like enemies that put you to sleep, reduce your stats to zero, and uh, make you just die to everything. It's, it's definitely worth using a sleep to negate a sleep. Or using a silence, you know, that's possible too. Berserk is very annoying, I will admit, um, especially if you have your army spread out across a forest with teleportation tiles, and then you have to get your restore user with like one or two movements <laughs> to that person that's being berserked. I can see that being very annoying, so I won't put it in the highest possible tier, uh, but we'll throw it like, I don't know, like B tier. It's fine. It's not massively impactful. Alright, it is massively impactful, but it's not massively anti-player or pro-player. Like, it hurts and helps both ways. Um... So, in that way, it, it is very fun, though. But I can also see it, like, draining the fun out of the game because the game becomes all about status stabs with infinite range and warp stabs with infinite range. So, that's why I'm putting it kind of in the middle. It is what I enjoy about Thracia, but I can see why a lot of people wouldn't like it. Uh, stealing. I'm pretty sure this is stealing the skinning skills. Uh, probably referring to the fact that thieves can steal anything. Just, not just items, but also weapons if their build is high enough and their speed is higher than the enemies. Yeah, that's a good mechanic, it's very fun. My very first playthrough consistent of RNG abusing Lifus to get the most possible build and speed and strength that I could. And I gave him scrolls and safe stated all around. Arena abused everything, the whole nine yards. Is it the nine yards? I think it is. Um, just to be able to steal everything. It made the game very tedious, but the first time I didn't actually uh, hate it. Like, I actually thought it was a fun way to play. But like I said, for capturing, it can be tempting to try and steal everything you see, even though you don't need to, and you're making the game harder for yourself than it needs to be, so... I recommend, again, going for easier steals, or stealing whatever you're comfortable with and just killing the rest. I know, for example, in Manster, there's like a bazillion enemies with vulnerabilities, and like I said earlier, vulnerabilities are elixir, so it's tempting to steal as much as you can, but... at some point it gets too tedious just to stop stealing vulnerabilities. <laughs> you don't need infinite vulnerabilities. But, they are good. So, we, uh, we put stealing in, uh... I'm pretty sure there is, isn't it? Uh, I think it's less bad than capturing because stealing isn't as tedious as capturing is if you're doing it slightly suboptimally. So I think I can throw it in S. I think it's a great part of Thracia. Like being able to just disarm enemies while stealing is just so funny. Universal stat caps. All stats except HP cap at 20 in Thracia. I think this is a great change to Thracia. It makes units unable to really, really trivialize the game. It saves some challenges. Like you can still make bosses challenging. I do think that caps don't really stop the player from overpowering generic enemies most of the time. Uh, the, like, besides in the final chapter, almost every enemy is trivial to fight in Thracia because you outstack the enemy by so much. Even though they're universally capped, there's like... The amount of enemies that are actually threatening in Thracia are... You can count them on one hand, I feel like. 
uh, because of this. Assuming you have scroll abu abuse units or units that have used scrolls throughout the game. Your units are just so much better than the enemies, generally speaking. Uh, the exception is bosses with their massive thrones. I'm surprised there's actually no throne, like plus 10 defense throne on here. Uh, but besides those, you usually just like wreck everything, I find. So um, they don't really help with that. and they But they do incentivize people to promote early, which is something that I've tried to do in like six years of Fire Emblem Pitfalls. And some people still won't do it. Um, so in that way, most people accept that Thracia early promotion is good. So in that sense, it's a big success. So I do like them in that regard, and I like that they keep the final chapters challenging, because even though you have units with like 20 stats all around, the bosses also have really good stats in that chapter, but they also have the magic floors. Uh, if you haven't played Thracia yet, you'll, you'll know what I mean. So that's almost an equalizer, I think. So yeah, I like universal stat caps. They're not like massively influential, but they're pretty good. We'll throw them around here somewhere. Um, this is Vantage, and is it? It's okay. They're separate. <laughs> okay, so Vantage is just a guarantee in Thracia. You just attack first, and then you know, that's it. <laughs> that's all it does. Uh, it doesn't work with Wrath, unlike in many other games. So if you have Vantage and you have Wrath, um, Wrath doesn't work because Vantage checks to see. I think, I think Wrath checks if you're counterattacking, and if you're attacking first with Vantage, then the game doesn't see that as a counterattack, and so you don't cure it. So. Wrath is just you attack first, or Vantage is just you attack first, no matter what. It's like, I think it's the same as in Path of Radiance. It's uh, fine, we'll throw in like a Depth tier, because it's kind of hard to rely on Vantage to do anything unless you're using a Brave Weapon, and those are limited, and also you have the two-hit kill, which is a little rare, uh, but there are occasions where you can make a Vantage build work, um, but it's rare. Uh, Wrath is insanely broken and fun. You get two units very early with Wrath, Orson and Brighton, and they're both able to use it very well, uh, one of them a little bit more than the other. There's not much to say about Wrath, I mean you crit when you counterattack, guaranteed. It's the best Wrath we've had in the series, it's super super broken, that's what makes it fun. It doesn't outright trivialize the game because sometimes even, like sometimes the challenges require more than just really good combat, like you're talking about like long range threats, status stabs, um, enemies that can kill you are kind of threatening to Wrath users, so in that sense, it's held back a little bit, but for most generic combat, uh, Wrath just kind of mows through everything. And that's what makes it satisfying. Especially because the Orson just has a very satisfying crit animation as well. It has really good, well, units feel. So I do like Wrath a lot. I'll throw it in this tier. It's very powerful. There's not too much to say about it besides, yeah, you crit. <laughs> Finally, we have Xavier, the most Tracy of recruitment of them all. Xavier... I think might be the hardest recruitment in the series, outside of maybe like the Wolf Guard from FE12. It's really hard to find a competitor there. He requires you to free a bunch of NPCs that can be killed or captured by other enemies, then talk to a bunch of red enemies that try to kill you, uh, or movement star around, or try to kill themselves, and if any of that happens, then you just lose. Uh, I would never recommend you get Savior completely blind and with no safe stating. I recommend a healthy dose of safe stating your first time around just to like get a feel for how it works. Over the years we've become a lot better at recruiting Xavier. We've figured out some ways to make it easier, most notably the Sleep Sword. Uh, you can put the enemy armors to sleep and then you can talk to them with ease rather than having to constantly keep them alive without killing them or without them killing you. It's a hard balance to walk. Uh, but it also made it completely optional. You don't have to recruit Xavier. But it's still rewarding if you do, first of all because of the accomplishments, but second of all because Xavier himself is good. Not so good in the part that he's worth recruiting in a sense that you get more out of it than you get out of, uh, you know, just getting through the chapter and skipping him. Like, he's good, but he's not busted, so he's not obligatory. It's a, he's a nice balanced unit in a way. He's a good unit balanced out by his bad recruitment in that sense. And I do enjoy that as well. Um, Xavier is definitely peak Tracy in that sense. So, yeah, we'll throw him an ST as well. There you go. Um, that is the whole tier list, so you can see I put a bunch of things in S tier and A tier, so that might tell you that I do like Thracia, I've never pretended to not be biased, but it is a very good game, and I recommend you play it, I haven't played it in ages, but just making this tier list alone made me want to replay it. So, that's gonna do it for today, hope you enjoyed it, sorry for the lack of a uh, stream, but like I said, today's not a great day for it, and I, I do need my sleep. So, I will see you guys all uh, next time, enjoy your day, peace around, goodbye.